All right. Mm, so hi everyone. Welcome to the Gulf School. For those who are new here, uh, just uh, somewhat info about what is going on in the school now. We are going. We are going through lectures on topological K theory. We so far had the first lecture on topological K theory, which was an introduction to vector bundles. And in today's lecture, Dr. Mahit is going to continue from where he left off. So yeah. Up to you. Uh, let, uh, let me recap. Uh, so, last lecture. Yeah. Right. So, number one, we introduced vector bundles. Like, as a locally trivial space at given any point around which the vector bundle looks like x cross a vector space, right? u cross a vector space. So it's a locally trivial vector bundle. Use vector bundle, right? We call it use the abbreviation VB for a vector bundle. Number two, uh, we used, uh, we defined operations on vector bundles. Number three, uh, right. So one of the results, so operations on vector bundles, like if we had two vector bundles, E comma F over X, then we could define direct sum uh, tensor, right, form, E comma F, right? And basically, so the way we did this is like we took any arbitrary functor and showed that this can be done for the corresponding functor, like for a reasonably good functor, which like with a very mild condition called a continuous functor, right? A corollary that we showed during this time is the following. Sections of um, form E comma F are in one one are in one one correspondence. Are in one one correspondence with uh, uh, homomorphisms of uh, E to F. Right, so this is one useful fact. Right, then uh, we went into defining sub bundles and quotient. So a, a sub bundle is effectively an injective mapping from one bundle to other another, and a, and if we have a sub bundle, we can always define a quotient bundle, right? We saw if we had a vector bundle homomorphism from E to F such that uh, it was a constant rank map.
then uh, the kernel, if let's say this map was phi, then kernel phi is vector bundle. Uh, co kernel is a vector bundle. Image is a vector bundle. Co kernel is a vector bundle. And uh, fin the final result that we ended with was the following, that if we had a map, if we had a short exact sequence, E to F to G of vector bundles, then this such an exact sequence necessarily splits. Right, so this is a typical topological property. We had to use things like partition, uh, partitions of unity and such. Okay. Um, I'll also share the Jamboard link. So here's the Jamboard link. If you want to look back, you can use that. Um, So, huh. last time I was informed that uh, the categorical way of defining operations became too technical. So, I will uh, kind of just, as an example, prove how, uh, uh, to what, what, how does, whatever we did in that case, how does it make sense for direct sums, right? So again, let E comma F be two vector bundles. Let U alpha I'll stop sharing the screen. Stop my video. Right. Let u alpha be uh, a cover such that both both e and f are trivial on it. Right. So we choose a common cover on which both happen to be trivial. Like both trivialize on each u alpha that is there. Okay, so the way this worked is we know that e on u alpha is trivial. So it's u alpha cross some v, right? And similarly, f is also f u alpha. Oh, and the notation f u alpha uh, denotes. Um, the pullback of the vector bundle to u alpha. And as it, in this case, since it's a subset, it would be more like just look at the inverse image of u alpha. So this would be u alpha cross w. And uh, what we're saying is right. So, the one thing that we had, like the that we sh like the fun like the basic idea was that for the trivial bundle, the way you uh, define the operation is just to define it to be trivial. So, when we define e direct sum f u alpha, we'll basically just define it to be u alpha cross B direct sum W. So on trivial bundles, you just do the thing. Right? Now, but the real question is how do we define E direct sum F directly? So the way this is done is first of all, this is a set. So as a set, this is disjoint union of 
P in X, P in X, EP direct sum FP. Each one of these is a vector space, right? Okay, so if, if you have any questions, please tell me anytime, right? And uh, the, now what we want to do is you want to give E direct some effort topology. So the way we give E direct some effort topology is to say that V subset of E direct some F is open if V intersected with, uh, what should I say? E direct sum F U alpha is open for all alpha. So the point is this E direct sum U alpha is topologized by saying that this map is an isomorphism. And then, and not, then we can see that if, so on intersections, what we'll normally notice is that there would be two different topologies, one coming from U alpha and one coming from V alpha, right? But because the functor that we had, namely the direct sum is a very nice operation. As a consequence, what happens is, uh, we'll end up with uh, maps like this. Did, um, I, some... did, I, did I do something no. wrong? No, no, I'm, I'm asking. So there is a question. Uh, yes, how yes. can you justify that there is always such a cover U alpha on which both E and F are trivial? Um, basically, uh, take a covering for E alpha on which E is trivial, take a covering for F, like take a covering for F and then uh, intersect them. Like, you know, if you have U alpha and V alpha, just intersect them. You know, so you, if you have U alpha, U beta, uh, V beta, then you consider the covering as uh, U alpha intersection V beta. And now this is the indexing set will go over alpha and beta. That's it. So you can very easily ensure that, that there are coverings on which both are trivial. Because the moment something is trivial on you, it's also trivial on a subset. That's what we're really using. So if there is any question, please ask. Like I will be very happy to answer. So, and uh, this is open. And so the only real conflict as we just talked about is what happens on the intersection. So on the intersection, what is happening is that we have E direct sum F U alpha intersection U beta. This is getting isomorphic to U alpha intersection V beta. Uh, I don't have space. You know what, I'll just write it in the next page. So we have like E U alpha intersection U beta, right? This is isomorphic to U alpha intersected with intersected with U beta cross V direction W in one way and in another way. Right. So, and the point is that the map so induced that we'll get will be something very nice. So it's like if the map for E was phi and W was psi, this would be something like phi direct some psi. Right, something like this given by such a matrix. And 
what we are really trying to say is that on this intersection, this the topology that we will get a map which will happen to be continuous because direct sum is a very nice operation. And as a consequence, this map, we will get a map like this and a map in the reverse direction, both being homeomorphism, which shows that the topology is induced by taking any one of these as isomorphisms will give, give me the same topology. So there is no conflict on the intersection. Right? And using this, we now see that the topology that we have really given on e direct sum f is kind of well defined. That, yeah. So this is all. This is what we really did in uh, using all the functorial language that we did. So uh, now uh, today we begin. Uh, the homotopic pro homotopy proper homotopic whatever homotopic properties of vector bundles. Okay, so so two things that I would like to recall before we begin. So the, the all the homotopic properties that we are going to see are typical to uh, the continuous uh, category only and not to uh, or the differential category as we'll see why uh, but they these will not follow in the analytic or the algebraic case because the main tools that we are going to use are bump functions and uh, partitions of unity right so bump functions Right, so this uh, we know bump functions exist because of okay. I don't know how to spell this. Jurisson's lemma. I don't know how to spell Jurisson. Forgive me for that. Right, but yeah. So it will follow because of Jurisson's lemma. As follows, if why? Oh, and also um, we we will concentrate only to compact Hausdorff spaces. So that's one thing to keep in mind that we are only dealing with compact Hausdorff spaces. Like it is possible to extend all the results that we are showing to more general spaces li like locally compact or even weekly compactly generated weekly Hausdorff. But uh, it, but if we work with compact Hausdorff spaces, we kind of get a idea of why these are what kind of theorems are there with easy proofs, right? So that is why I will restrict our attention to compact Hausdorff spaces. So if Y is a closed subset of X, right? And U, uh, is an open subset of X containing Y, right? Then there exists a function F from X to zero one. Such that f restricted to y is identically one, and f restricted to u complement is identically zero. So it's like this is a function which takes one on y and zero everywhere else, a zero outside of that open neighborhood. Right, and uh, another thing that we'll use is called partition of unity. Right, so if U alpha is a covering, U 
then there exist uh u beta a finer cover uh such that for every point p is not i will not say finite finer cover i'll say finite cover no it is finite sorry so that giving any p has right also i'll also assume finite cover because we are in compact might as well take that so it's a finite cover and is also finer which is the more important point such that there is a function so there are functions rho beta on so such that there exist functions rho beta going from x to 0,1 such that um rho beta is ident rho beta restricted to u complement u beta complement is identically zero and summation of all rho beta is equal to 1 as a function constant function 1 so this is called a partition of unity because these are function which sum up to 1 right so i am pretty sure people have already seen this so now uh we'll start using these tools to on vector bundles to produce uh uh various lemmas for them and we are what we are really moving towards is like uh something like uh, isomorphism classes of vector bundles are and homotopy invariants something like that uh, which i'll explain as the time comes any questions till now let e be oh let's go on why be a section to e by then right so okay so so the statement says the following let e be a vector bundle over x and uh, let s be a section s let me call this sy sy be a section or uh, from y to ey as in there is a right and one assumption is that y is a closed subset of x so if we have a closed subset of x suppose we have a section of a closed subset then we can extend the section to all of x right so uh, this is a uh, fairly easy what we do is to the finite cover right so this is like a slightly complicated argument actually so extends to a section right so uh choose right so proof pf right 
choose a open covering. U alpha. Choose the open covering U alpha. Extend the section to the right. Right, such that of course E is trivial. And uh, there is a, and we have a row alpha, which are a partition of unity. Is a partition of unity. Okay, so this is the step one. Now what we do is we see that given any point P in X, right? Actually given any point P in X, it will be contained in one of these U alphas, right? Because it's a covering, right? So in fact, let's take P in Y and let, uh, P we contain in some u alpha. If it's contained in u beta, I will also do this the same procedure for u beta as well. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry, 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 sorry. Sorry, this is not what we are doing. We look at y intersected with u alpha, right? On this, we notice that the vector bundle is trivial, right? So the section since E is trivial on U alpha, we can extend the section If by any chance the open subset does not intersect Y, we'll take the function, right? We can extend the section to uh, U alpha. Sorry. Yes, U alpha, right? And so this extended section we'll call S alpha, right? S alpha is on U alpha. Uh, now, if this uh, uh, open subset does not intersect Y, we'll assign S alpha to be zero. So in this way, for every open subset, where we have obtained an extension, right? So uh, we now define SX to be equal to sum of rho alpha S alpha. Since sum of rho alpha is actually equal to one, whenever we encounter a point of y, uh, the numbers will just add up. The values of the function will just add up and give me exactly the old fu function s y. And that's it. So this proves that we can always extend sections. Okay, any questions? So how do you know the actually an extension function on all of x? No, uh, come again. Like you have defined uh, S X is equal to summation rho alpha u alpha. Uh, yes. 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 Uh, can you prove it is actually a section? Oh, so so okay. You, what you are asking is that uh, why is uh, rho alpha S alpha is like why is that just this multiplication itself a section of all of x is that what you're asking yes. so the point is that uh, notice the property of rho alpha is that 
this function is zero outside of your alpha. Okay. So when I write row alpha s alpha, what I'm actually defining is uh, is basically a function which is zero. This is uh, if p zero if p uh, belongs to x minus u alpha. That's the definition. Right, and what rho alpha is actually doing is ensuring that the function s alpha by multiplying it, I'm ensuring that it continuously goes to the zero, goes to zero within u alpha itself. Right, so this is why we multiply with the partition of unity to ensure that the section just continuously tapers off to zero as soon as it goes out of u alpha. So that's why we take this. So is this clear? Did this answer your question? Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Chalo, let me continue. Then, lemma. So let f from e to f such that f restricted to y so we are we have a homomorphism from uh, a vector bundle e to f such that that restricted to f y right restricted to f is an isomorphism Then uh, F is an isomorphism in a neighborhood of Y. Right, and again, uh, the assumption here, which I have for some reason forgotten to mention is that y is closed in x. Right? This need not always be the case, but for this one it is. For this and the next lemma also, this will be the assumption. So uh, the proof is simply is, is roughly just the following that isomorphisms is an open subset. <laughs> and so the point side which it's an isomorphism is an open subset, so it must and it can it's an open subset containing y. So let me just write the proof. So now f can be regarded as sections f going from x to form. E comma f. Remember, like any homomorphism is actually a section of the home bundle, right? This is something that we discussed last time, right? Within this, there is an open subset of isomorphisms from E to f. This is open, right? And now that's all we need to do. We just look at the like since this is an open subset, we and the inverse image of this open subset contains y. So we are done. So this is exactly that. The that is exactly the proof. So any questions? Right. Okay. This this I'll name as. I think I need numbers here. So this was lemma one. This was lemma two. And now we're going to deal with lemma three. Let E comma F be vector bundles on X such that F is a map from EY to FY is an isomorphism. So given an isomorphism on EY to FY, right, on a closed subset. Of course, as usual, y is closed 
in x right then uh, this isomorphisms extends to a neighborhood neighborhood of y so again we use the same trick that we did just now fy can be regarded as a section from y to form ey comma fy which i'll just say is e comma f y right so the fibers match and we can check everything else Okay. Hello. Then any hmm? no, sir. E Y. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are audible. So this E Y is the restriction of that E on Y, right? Yes, yes, exactly. Just that. Okay. Yeah. It's in in a very little set, it's an inverse image. Yeah, basically, yeah, right, right. Yes. Okay, so so now we have a section, right? And what we saw is that if I have a section, I can extend it to the whole space. So that means we can extend by lemma one, we get a section fx from x to home e comma f x. So sorry, just that, right? And now, as we saw in the last lemma, isomorphism in an open subset, right? Isomorphisms are an open subset. So in particular, we'll get that there exists open subset Fu such that uh, Eu to Fu is an isomorphism. Right, which and of course, uh, y is contained inside the field. So, this finishes the proof. Now, uh, we come to a very important result proving homotopy invariance of sorts theorem. Let E be a vector bundle on X cross I. Then E res restricted to this is isomorphic to E restricted to X cross one. So we roughly have this kind of a picture. If this was X cross I, and the vector bundle on this slice is same as the vector bundle on this slice. This is the zeroth X. So if we had a vector bundle E here, then E restricted to this slice is isomorphic to E restricted to this slice. And uh, so let's prove and truthfully, whatever we have been doing all three, four lemmas, that, three lemmas that we did were in preparation for the theorem. So let phi be a function from x cross i to x. Note e x cross Right. So, okay, uh, let me. Cancel. So, I define, uh, let's say, F to be E restricted to X cross P for some T. Okay. 
define. Now the statement is that F is isomorphic to pi upper star of F, right? Restricted again back to X cross T. Right? So, and note that F is by definition E restricted to X cross T. Right? So now we have two vector bundles which have been restricted, which are isomorphic when restricted to the exact same subset. Okay. So we can apply lemma three. Okay. So we apply lemma three. This implies there exists neighborhood X cross I'll say T minus epsilon T plus epsilon. Right? Such that this isomorphism extends. Iso okay. So just from this much, so but notice what is this guy. This guy, if we notice, if like it is effectively like just the same bundle F, 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 F for all time t. Okay. This is F for all time t. That's basically what it is. This is basically just F cross I to x cross i. That's, that's what this vector bundle really is, right? So that means the we immediately see that uh, the two endpoints on this interval must actually be isomorphic, right? Any questions? So this implies uh, E, T minus, not maybe not minus epsilon, but minus delta is isomorphic to x cross t x cross t minus t plus delta. Now, because we were working for like this argument works for all t, what we'll do is we'll end up covering the interval uh, with so many intervals. And for each interval, we'll see this kind of a thing that we'll have t minus delta, t plus delta, all of which being isomorphic. Right? And so we'll see that the actual endpoints of the interval themselves must become isomorphic, proving the statement. Any questions? This is a bit of a so please feel free to ask questions. So let's take a corollary. Let f comma g be function from y to x be homotopic. Right, so let me call. I'll just call this f zero comma f one. Right, so kind of denoting that there will be some xt's in the middle. Right, let E be a vector bundle on X. Then F zero upper star y is isomorphic to F one upper star y, but not y e. So proof. Uh, look at the bigger homotopy 
y cross i to x, right? F upper star of uh, what is it? T e restricted to y uh, y cross zero is isomorphic to F upper star E Y cross one by the previous lemma. This is by definition uh, F one upper star E. This is by definition F zero upper star E, right? So we have now shown that pullback of the same vector bundle along homotopic maps is isomorphic or I, or in fact, I could say it in the fashion that pullback of isomorphic vector bundles under homotopic maps are uh, isomorphic. Okay, so it seems to show us that the homotopy classes of maps, the isomorphism classes of vector bundles seems to be preserved under homotopic maps. Right? So this is the kind of statements we were we are interested in that okay so another uh, fact that we did not really properly do last time but we'll state now so define ISO classes of vector bundles find vector NX to be ISO classes. Rank and vector Okay. So, hello, 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 sir. In, in the last corollary that you just proved, uh -huh. so there, uh, what we just proved that uh, the equal maps are pulled back to basically isomorphic vector bundles. Yes. Right, so and then you generalize that statement, right? After that, saying that we can even do that for uh, isomorphic map, uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. of course, of course. So, I mean, but this proof is only for uh, a particular case, and then both the bundles are equal, exactly, right? Meaning, I mean, what uh, what we initially took was that there was only one bundle E on X, right? Huh, so if there are isomorphic vector bundles, then there will be an isomorphism there. Their pullbacks will therefore become isomorphic. Okay, I we'll have a okay. bunch of isomorphism, we'll compose them and we'll get isomorphic. Yeah, yeah. It's complicated work. <laughs> yeah, so. Right. So now, one thing to like, not for all already, but a statement that we did not do last time properly, but I'll write it written now. If I have a map Y from Y to X, sorry, oh, sorry, this is not what is important. This is important. This vector N that we vector of spaces that we see, they are closed under direct sums, right? So that kind of gives us an addition in the isomorphism classes of all vector bundles. Similarly, tensor gives uh, multiplication. This becomes addition. Multiplication. Right? The only problem, and in fact, the tensor distributes over addition. So we basically have a ring, right? Except uh, the only problem is that we don't have negative of a vector, vector space or vector bundle, right? So that is a bit of a problem, 
right? And uh, when we go to K group, we rectify that. But for now, what we have is called a semi ring. Okay. And one point to notice is that if I have a map from Y to X, right, some random map between spaces, then F upper star of E direct sum F is in fact equal to F upper star of E direct sum F. Similarly for tensors. Right? The consequence of this is that what we are ending up with is that uh, F upper star gives a semi ring homomorphism vect x to vect y in the reverse direction. Right? F upper star. Right? And uh, so finally, I'll just state two more corollaries of the homotopy invariance. Three, if, um, I won't prove them. If X to Y is a homotopy equivalence, then uh, vect X is isomorphic to vect y, right? And uh, another corollary of just this very statement is if uh, x is contractible, and uh, E is a vector bundle on x, then E is trivial. So just the homotopy equivalence, homotopy invariance shows us that if x happens to be contractible, then any vector bundle on x will automatically become trivial. Right? So I leave these two as an exercise. Right? Now, in the remaining time, I will do two important constructions of vector bundles. As in, I'll just explain. Right? So, suppose I have a vector bundle. No. So, the aim is so y is a subset of x. Okay. Close. Aim make a vector bundle on E. Oh, sorry, make vector bundle on x mod y. This is the first game. That how do you construct vector bundles on a on the quotient space, right? So we'll need to impose some extra conditions on by itself. So uh, on the vector bundle, otherwise it won't work. But let E be a vector bundle on x such that uh, why, uh, such that E restricted to Y is trivial. Okay. Why are some isomorphism alpha? Right. Then, uh, define, right. So if we have such a vector bundle, the aim is to get a new vector bundle on uh, y. Right? So we have this vector bundle E alpha, 
right? It is construction is extremely dependent on alpha, which is E modulo some equivalence relation, where the equivalence relation is. Oh, and uh, we define the map projection map to be pi. Okay, projection map to V to be pi. Is that if I have two elements V is related to V prime, if uh, alpha uh, pi composed alpha of V pi alpha of V is in fact equal to pi alpha of V prime. Okay. So this gives us um where is this? Okay. Right? So this makes sense, right? So this is the equal installation we make. Right? And the reason why we took the bundle to be trivial on Y is something like the moment something collapses to a point, it has to be trivial. So that's kind of the reason why we did this. Anyways, so the next part is right to show that the thing that we have just constructed is actually a vector bundle, right? So E alpha is locally trivial. on x minus y, right? This is rather easy to see. The complement of that one point, we can very easily see that, right? Now, E alpha is locally trivial. No. Now, note that E is locally trivial, is trivial on on y, right? The original vector bundle, you, E itself was trivial on y. This implies that trivialization extends to an open neighborhood. Remember that given any section we could extend it, we, and when we use that property of section extension to say that if there is a isomorphism, that also extends to a neighborhood, right? So here we have an isomorphism to trivial, that extends to an isomorphism in a neighborhood to trivial, right? So E is trivial in a neighborhood. Right? Now this implies E alpha that we possessed is in fact trivial in a neighborhood of y mod y, right? That one point that we'll end up getting. So this shows that it is uh, locally trivial. If say alpha naught is a uh, homotopic, any questions? We have just constructed a vector bundle in the portion. Any questions anybody wants to ask? Then E of alpha T gives a vector bundle on X mod Y cross I, right? So the point is, so when I say homotopic, I mean homotopic via uh, isomorphisms. So the homotopy isomorphism, right? Homotopy has the property that at every point time t, the map we'll get is an isomorphism. So for each point t, we can then construct a new vector bundle on x mod y. And that gives us a vector bundle on x mod y cross i, right? Because 
the changes are all continuous and all. And therefore, as we saw that the two endpoints must therefore become isomorphic. So E alpha naught is isomorphic to E alpha naught. So what we see is that this vector bundle that we get depends only on the homotopy class of alpha and not generally what alpha is. Right? Now, arguably one of the most important constructions. Any questions till now? Right. So I'll do it in simplicity. There is a more complicated way of doing this also, but we will not go into that. So let X be a union of two spaces. I am going to call them X and X minus. And a be equal to x plus intersected with x minus right again the aim is to uh, so now the aim in a in side kind of like the reverse direction the aim is to make Right, given vector bundles on X plus E plus minus on X plus minus. So we have two vector bundles. Construct a vector bundle on X. Okay. So when we construct a vector bundle on X, we'll need some extra data precisely like before. So the data here will be, so what we really want to do is we want these two vector bundles and on the intersection, we want them to glue together. So to glue, we'll have to give an isomorphism E plus A to E minus A. Okay, this isomorphism. And this we are going to use to glue together uh, the vector bundles, right? So the aim is to construct vector bundle on on X, right? So definition we can easily give. We already have a pretty good idea what we want to do. Just take the disjoint union of these two. Modulo the equivalence relation. P, which belongs to E plus, is related to V prime in E minus if phi of P is equal to V prime. Okay. So that's all. That, that's the glue. Like that's that's how we just glue them together. Right? Now the comes the real hard part. Right? Show that this is actually a vector bundle. I mean this is locally trivial. Right. Again. Whatever we have constructed, what was the name? Yes, I gave it E phi code because it will, of course, depend on phi and, of, and E plus and E minus, but we are somehow suppressing them. Right? So E phi um, is locally trivial.
right? So e phi is locally trivial on X. E phi is locally trivial on X minus A. So if there, if it's not a point of A, then there is nothing to really check, right? Because we're doing nothing when it's not a point of A. Oh, also, I completely forgot to mention these are uh, closed compact sets, not open set sets. Closed compact. Right, and uh, yeah, that's it. A closed uh, compact is automatic since we are assuming things are compact out there. Okay, any questions till now? Then I'll start showing that the clutching construction is in fact locally trivial. So now what we want to say is that given a point A in A, then Let U1 be a compact neighborhood you know what let me call this U plus U plus be a compact neighborhood of A in X plus such that E plus is trivial. Right. Now, the point is E plus restricted to A will also be trivial, like, sorry, restricted to U plus intersected A will also be trivial. But because we chose this to be a compact neighborhood, we now see that U plus intersection A is a subset of X, close subset of X minus. Right? So, right? But this is trivial. So uh, extend the trivialization to a neighborhood, again compact neighborhood. plus intersection A and you will call this neighborhood in X minus, right? We know that if the vector bundle is trivial on a subset, then it is trivial on a open, it's trivial on an open neighborhood and we can always take a closed subset, closed open neighborhood. So now what we can do is we can have this E plus restricted to U plus and union E plus 
e minus restricted to u minus modulo tilde modulo the equivalent relation we previously determined right so we know that this is a uh, compact right right now so this way we have kind of found a a neighborhood where which seems like a candidate for a trivialization now it is i leave it as an exercise that uh, figure out how to prove that this not this neighborhood this need not be the correct one but we can now shrink the neighborhoods further if required to show that this new thing that we have constructed is in fact uh, isomorphic to trivial shrink this is Okay. Um, okay, and uh, now more or less the same argument as before. Um, that if I had two homotopic maps here. Then they would produce isomorphic vector bundles. The same argument, namely that this, since these were homotopic via isomorphisms, each isomorphism will produce for me a new vector bundle. So in end of, we'll end up getting a vector bundle on X cross I, and the endpoints are there for isomorphic vector bundles. Right? Any questions? Otherwise, I'll move into the last. Thing for today. So uh, for this theorem, I'm going to use F, the field is equal to C. Otherwise, there are some complications which we which we'll see in the course of the proof. I'll clearly mention what happens. Uh, vector spaces of rank n over the suspension of x is isomorphic to homotopy classes of maps from x to gl n Any questions till here? People with me? Yeah. Okay, so I'll begin. So, um, suspension X is equal to cone plus of x, right, union cone minus of x. So if x was this space and we are suspending it like this, right, then I'll take the half the part here and call it cone plus and I'll call this cone minus, okay? You know what, I'll just keep the diagram, right? Right, something like this. The upper part I'll call cone plus, the lower part I'll call cone minus. And now it's not very difficult to see 
is that cone plus of x intersected with cone minus of x is isomorphic to uh, sorry is actually uh, is just x right so it's the middle space and that's just x another important point to note is that both the cones are contractible right so since they are contractible vector bundles over a contractible space are trivial right like that that's like the very important shape um okay so let us properly begin now so let e be a vector bundle on suspension x right then right and uh, then let e plus hello huh? this okay. last isomorphism is isomorphism as what that's semiring is it which one the in the last slide this isomorphism of uh, yeah that that isomorphism fact and oh. yeah so this is as a pointed set so that's it that's just a bijection really okay that's a bijection see the point is this is vect n okay okay okay, okay so vect n just means rank n vector bundles right vector right so you won't actually get the ring structure or anything like that okay Although there is a group structure here. I have thought about that. What does that do? So let E plus be the E plus minus. I'll just do it in one go. Be E restricted to C plus minus of X. Right. That's how you will define it. And note that both are trivial. <laughs> Right. Right. So both like both of these are trivial. So at least one part we have it. Right. So now look at e minus of x. This is by definition equal to e plus of x. Right. You know you restrict to subsets and then you restrict to pair intersection you'll just get the same restriction this is trivial by say alpha minus to x cross v some isomorphism but some trivialization which is produced from the lower cone right and this is isomorphic to x cross v by some alpha plus right so by composing like this we get a map phi from x cross v to x cross v right which is an isomorphism so but again homomorphisms correspond to uh homomorphs like correspond to sections to home but this is a trivial bundle so we might as well just we directly just get a map from we just this induces a map from x to uh isomorphism v to v which is glv right now the question is are so now let's just see how well defined this phi is right so this phi is well defined up to right so the home this homotopy class of phi so this phi is not really well defined but the homotopy class of alpha minus and alpha plus are going to be well defined up to uh, what is it called up to pi not like basically 
what are all possible trivializations? All possible trivializations will correspond to maps from uh, C plus X to GLV, right? The homotopy classes of these would, right, the homotopy classes of these correspond to, right, this is contractable. This is a single point, so contractable. So this just corresponds to pi naught of GLV. Right, the homotopy classes are well defined up to this pi naught. Right, without loss of generality, we can choose just assume one of them is trivial, so that doesn't hurt. But for the other one, we must have this pi naught going along. Right, so in particular, the homotopy classes of class of this say alpha minus is well defined up to pi naught of GLV. Right. And phi is, as we can see, just alpha plus compose alpha minus, right? Yeah, so phi is just this. And since this is, so any two maps that, any two possible trivializations that we can get differ by at most, so therefore any two trivialization any two map phi, phi, phi prime, differ by our uh, homotopic up to an action of pi naught GLV. Right. So using this, we will get a map from what is it called? A uh, vec n x to homotopy classes of maps from x to GLV modulo. What is it? Uh, why not GL? Right now. If we were working over complex numbers, this is trivial. And that makes our life easy, right? If we are working over real numbers, this is slightly complicated and it's Z mod two. And as it turns out for real numbers, this does happen to be an isomorphism. But since we, but since the proof is much easier for complex numbers, I'll just finish it for complex numbers, right? So, this is trivial as the field is complex numbers. Oh, oh I did get done to it. Yes, uh, let's go to the final page, last page. And uh, there we see right, what were we doing? Right, right, right. Right. So we have now obtained a map like this, right? From vect and x to homotopy classes of maps from x to GLV. Right? The map was like this clutching functions were well defined only up to homotopy. Now given if and we have already seen the clutching construction gives us a map in the reverse direction. Right? This is just this is what clutching construction did, did, and so we are now in a domain where we just need so we just uh, we just need to now check whether these two maps happen to be inverse. This is clutching construction. And this is what we just constructed. right? So check. the two maps are inverse of each other. Okay. 
Okay, so uh, this is where I'll end the lecture. Are there any questions? No question so far? Okay. So in that case, we'll end the session here and uh, meet next week.